I would like to welcome you to today's Collaborative on Health and the Environment's EMF Working Group Partnership Call. I'm Tony Stein, and I serve as the co-coordinator with Michael Lerner of JEMF Work Group, and I'm honored to be here today. I'm here today with Lloyd Morgan, Senior Research Fellow at the Environmental Health Trust. Hi, Lloyd. Hi. He's the director of the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. Thank you, Lloyd, for inviting Che to hold this webinar with EHT. I would like to acknowledge two very special people, Jersey S. in Poland and Dr. Hanak Tamar, MD, of Gainesville, Florida, who have generously shared their MP3s with us to successfully fuse back our audio feed that we lost from the video that is now something you're listening to. Thank you, Jersey and Hena. Okay, I would like to, before we start, just tell you a bit about CHE EMF Work Group so that those who are not members yet can have an opportunity to join. CHE is an international partnership committed to strengthening the scientific and public dialogue on environmental factors linked to chronic disease and disability. It was formed in 2002 at Commonweal by Michael Lerner and others. CHE acts as a catalyst for civil discourse and collaborative initiatives among researchers, health professionals, health-affected groups, and others concerned with social and environmental impacts on human health. CHE is a nonpartisan group and does not endorse any specific policies. I encourage anyone who is not currently a member of our group, to join us. And I'll send you information after the call on how to do that. We have several spectacular experts today on cell phone safety radiation and its impact on pregnancy, sperm, and offspring. All of our speakers today have provided their PowerPoint presentations as well as rele relevant published papers. The video of this webinar will be posted on our website at www.healthandtheenvironment.org. This is the web page that you're looking at, and all you need to do is go into today's working group calls, click on it, and scroll down the page for today's date, November 12, 2002, Click on it, open up the work group page for today's webinar, and you'll see all kinds of information about our speakers, as well as go to the background information page, and you'll find the webinar uh, um, from the National Pub, uh, Press Club, as well as the webinar from today's spe speakers, and all of the background information. Great. If you have any questions, please write me. Okay, moving on to our speakers. Our first spectacular speaker is Dr. Deborah Davis, and she is an award-winning, internationally renowned scientist and founder and president of her nonprofit organization, the Environmental Health Trust. Dr. Davis holds a PhD from the University of Chicago, as well as her postdoc fellowship in cancer epidemiology at um, John Hopkins University um, National Cancer Institute. She's a distinguished Nobel Peace Prize winner as she was the lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, research team, along with Honorable Vice President Al Gore in 2000. Seven. She has many awards, including the Rachel Carson Legacy Award by Rachel Carson Homestead, and she's a prolific writer. She's authored over 190 scientific publications, and she's written more than three renowned books, including When Smoke Ran Like Water in 2002 and The Secret History of the War on Cancer in 2008 and, of course, her 2010 book called Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation, What the Industry Has Done to Hide It, and How to Protect Your Family. All right. Well, I'm going to move 
on to introduce Dr. Deborah Davis. Thank you very much. Please join us. And I want to thank you, Tony, for an amazing job putting this together in such a short period of time. And I want to thank all of you out there listening, because this is a very, very important issue. Let me know what you bring up the first slide, Jason. Uh, um, all right. We're checking on the recording. All right. Jason, let me know when you can bring up the first slide. I'm just going to say that what I'm going to talk with you about today are some of the materials that we've had recently uh, discussed as the workshop in Boston Arena that was sponsored by the uh, Swiss government and other um, and, and industry as, as well as attended by experts around the world, where we discussed uh, reproductive and neurological impacts of global cell radiation. And uh, I'm going to go to the next slide and, and uh, say that one of the things that you will hear today uh, is that the Biological impact of the, the biological impact of non-ionizing radiation varies with um, the temperature, the weight characteristics, the cell type of the tissue exposed, intracellular signaling, and um, types of exposure to the liver response. The speakers who are with us today will provide more details about this, but it's very important to understand that these factors all affect what kind of response you're going to get. And often when you hear about conflicting studies, it's because the study thinks they're studying the same thing or not. A study is a continuous signal, not yet a pulse conditional signal. They study all the cells or cells that are more um, rich like lymphocytes and more vulnerable cells like stem cells. Um, so um, I will
you go over this in more detail, I simply play the big picture context. That you can really uh, control this. Look at the difference in the amount of um, melon dialyte, which is an indication of damage to the liver. And you can see it's a very large effect. Now, I want to briefly talk about what we're doing from. And it's important to understand that we actually have experiments done with human sperm, not just animal work as well. This is from Professor John Aiken, Cambridge University trained uh, embryologist and neurologist. He took sperm from healthy men and exposed to these test tubes. One test tube got exposed to sperm uh, to cell phone radiation at a level that did not induce heat. Very short count. And the other had no exposure at all. Normally, sperm will die. And if I can be permitted, I don't know if this will work in some of numerous points. You need approximately, approximately half a billion sperm to make one healthy baby. And the reason you need so many sperm is that sperm do not know how to ask for correction. But seriously, you need a lot of sperm to make one healthy baby. And you want the sperm to be able to swim, to be strong. What this work of Dr. Aiken shows is that exposed sperm drop their count very rapidly. And they die about three times faster than the control sperm species. here. This is a measure of motility, how well they can swim. And again, you see the control, pretty healthy, the exposed, not at all. And then this is a measure of damage to the mitochondrial DNA. And here you see that the exposed sperm are significantly more damaged. And mitochondria in the DNA is what gives the sperm energy for energy to be able to move. Um, a similar finding were done. The radiation involved here would have been cooking the sperm, a star of, of five watts per kilogram. That would have been heat. But you see an effect here where there is no heat. And that effect is shown again that you are decreasing sperm vitality and motility with levels that are not known to result in any heat at all. Um, now, this is some of the work that Professor Volkoff has demonstrated. She published this study in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, a year ago. And this is a collaborative effort with Brookhaven, the National Institute of Alcohol and Abuse, and National Institute of Drug Abuse. She is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And what they did was to expose a, a person to a cell phone, literally in this configuration, where the person did not know whether the phone was turned on or not. So they, they, they were blinded as to whether the phone was turned on. It was muted. It simply was on. And what they found was that spending 50 minutes with a cell phone turned on against the ear significantly altered cerebral glucose metabolism. And you can see the alteration in glucose metabolism right here. This is your control. This is your exposed. And this is, in fact, the area of the brain that would have the most exposure. It's the area that showed a significant increase in glucose metabolism. Then the summary of Dr. Volkov's work is that she found that those areas with the highest exposure corresponding to the uh, modeling that has been done on the brain had a significantly greater amount of sleep exposure and its effect on the brain. Um, unfortunately, her work has not been funded to continue. And given the government cuts right now, it's proven very difficult for her to continue with this work at Brookhaven. Now I'd like to uh, close by sharing with you the theory of what could be going on here. And I really want to invite you to look at this idea. There could be an effect of the cell phone that is having an effect on calcium efflux. Remember I said weakened membrane? And this would produce reactive oxygen species that can affect the formation of protein kinase and also sperm motility and enzymes. And so that in addition you could have another pathway from reactive oxygen species that would affect stress kinases. And affecting calcium efflux may be the part of a cascade of damage that could be happening within all membranes, whether it's the testes or the brain or the liver or the hippocampus or the dentate gyrus, that is leading 
fundamentally to a destabilization of cell memory, leading to a loss of DNA repair, of course, damage to DNA repair, and uh, abnormal motility and morphology, and ultimately to DNA break. As Mata Barita, we saw that there was a lot of difference of opinion about the evidence on DNA break and damage, but there was a general consensus that there is something going on. It's just we're not sure how finally we can cut into what is happening. And this might be a way to link it together. If you're interfering with NADH oxidase, and that that is why the membranes are uh, weakened. So I, I, this, this picture comes from Hamada at all. I am simply telling you I like it. Um, I did not develop it myself. The publication comes from the group at the Cleveland Clinic led by Asha Agarwal, and they have been developing work focusing on sperm impact. But it seems to me that all the things we're talking about here, the testis, the brain, the eye, the ear, they all have thin membranes that are vulnerable, and this might be the mechanism that could be involved for all of them. So you have altered calcium homostasis, <laughs> due to low frequency uh, electromagnetic fields, and you then get negatively charged phospholipid bilayer cell membranes that can affect divalent cations such as calcium that then has an effect. Um, this is a, a more elegant version of the same concept. And again, I will put these slides up for you to look at if it's in the Hamada at all places. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I am now going to introduce our next speaker and Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Igor Benaev and Goliath, thank you, and he is here from the National Cancer Institute of Slovakia, and he also um, is part of the Rus uh, serves on the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he, he will um, be speaking um, uh, from his PowerPoint that will be showing um, uh, it, 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 he has been researching for over 25 years, and um, his slides are co coming up right now. Um, his professional and research area is on biological and health effects of electromagnetic fields and ionizing radiation and DNA damage and repair and chromosomal aberrations, um, molecular markers for radiosensitivity. He is also the co-author of over 70 scientific publications and was on the expert, was one of the experts on the IRS workshop, which resulted in the finding that cell phone radiation in May of this year is uh, a possible carcinogen to be. And it's such an honor to have you. Thank you for speaking. Uh, so my name is Igor Bilaev, and uh, I graduated from Moscow University in 1981, and uh, started to work with biological effects of microwaves in 1986 in Moscow in Russia, and still have collaboration with my colleague, um, the Russian Academy of Science. So in 1994, I have moved to uh, Sweden. Stockholm University, and I will show some data obtained by my research group at Stockholm University. Uh, for now, I work for Cancer Research Institute at Slovak Academy of Science in Bratislava, uh, Slovak Republic. So this slide represents well-known um, electromagnetic spectrum showing uh, that different frequencies of electromagnetic fields are attributed to different branches, and today we will talk only about very short frequency range, uh, microwave, by definition it's between 300 megahertz and 300 gigahertz. So microwaves for the synthesis standard uh, are most often based on thermal effects of microwaves. 
And for this thermal effect of microwaves, what is most important is the power density or specific absorption rate, SIR, uh, which actually uh, defines uh, the heating of the biological tissue. And if biological tissue is heated, then current surface standards consider this type of exposure as uh, detrimental. And vice versa in IGNIOP safety standards at least, non-thermal uh, exposure conditions are not considered to be detrimental, they are safe. On the other hand, the safety standards significantly vary between different countries, and the question is why. And the answer is very simple, uh, because many groups over the world describe so-called non-thermal biological responses to microwaves including those related to cancer. And uh, by saying non-formal, we mean that this type of exposure doesn't hit significantly the biological tissue. So if you look at the literature, then approximately 70% uh, of available experimental studies report non-formal biological effects, while other 30% of studies, they do not show positive effect and the negative. And uh, actually uh, the, the main reason why it's so is that non-thermal effect, contrary to thermal effect, depends on many other parameters and many other conditions of exposure. And uh, among those physical parameters, what is, what is most important is the frequency, modulation, polarization, coherence time, dose and duration of exposure, intermittent, and also electromagnetic environment, which includes extremely low frequency uh, electromagnetic fields as the place of exposure to microwaves, and even static magnetic fields. In this slide, uh, I, I try to systemize <coughs> those uh, physical and biological uh, parameters which are of importance for biological effects of, <coughs> of microwave, non-thermal effect of course. I systemize them in two different uh, groups. And the first group actually those parameters which have been reported by really many research groups, which include carrier frequency modulation, of course specific absorption rate, or it's actually those rate and also those accumulated uh, energy and duration of exposure, as well post-exposure time, genotype and cell type, physiological traits, presence of radical scavengers and antioxidants. And the second group of parameters, those which have been described by some research groups, but uh, we cannot consider them as uh, really uh, supported by many different studies, and this can be taken only as an indication of uh, importance of these parameters for non-thermal effects. And this is the polarization, intermittent, uh, intermittent and coherent time of exposure, electromagnetic spray field, static magnetic field, sex, age, individual trait, and cell density during exposure. It's very clear that uh, all those parameters should be kept very strictly in replication studies because otherwise the taken conclusion can be made that uh, non reproducibility is absorbed with non thermal effect of microwave. So now I would like to, to show some data uh, obtained uh, when I worked in Moscow and that was obtained with looking at chromatin uh, Condensation. This slide represents several types of uh, several levels of organization of chromatin in cells. And one, one of the most important levels which we use for our analysis is so-called uh, DNA loops, which can be actually visualized uh, by using different techniques. And one of those techniques, so-called uh, ometacetate, microcometacetate. Here we can see a normal human lymphocyte 
DNA is changed here in red, so because DNA is negatively charged, so if you put this structure in electric field, so DNA loops start to move from minus to plus, and you can see this kind of structure which resembles comet, and that's why this technique got the name comet assay actually. So using different uh, exposure, you can induce, for example, damage or uh, really super coil to DNA loops, and you can get longer DNA loops as shown in this particular picture. And the uh, vice versa, using some kind of treatment, in this case, we use uh, intercalator of uh, to DNA, to DNA sodium bromide, you can actually also to condense DNA loops. And this picture shows condensation of DNA loops. Those three different pictures shown also here using another technique which we call anomalous viscosity design dependent. So this is in red. Peak corresponding to normal cell here. This relaxed chromatin in yellow correspond to this kind of picture. And very small peak in green correspond to condensed chromatin. So anyway, we have used this technique to look at uh, effect of, of microwave on living cells. So this slide demonstrates example of frequency response. And uh, we have plotted changes in chromatin condensation obtained by the AVTD technique I showed in the previous slide. You can and uh, again frequency of microwave exposure. You can clearly see a uh, highly resonant response in very good narrow frequency band or frequency windows. Here for example in this window also some the compensation of chromatin is seen in this window and that window and other frequencies like here do not produce any effect on chromatin at all. So that that's why demonstrate a frequency dependent effect of non-thermal uh, microwave on living cells. Uh, another important parameter is uh, of course density and this graph shows uh, response of living cells to microwave at different uh, power densities even in watts per centimeter squared. And uh, you can clearly see so-called intensity window in very wide range of intensity, 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 50 up to 10 to the minus 7, or actually 10 to the minus 9. You can see a effect which is quite stable in this intensity range, and at low intensity and at normal intensity, no any effect was seen. This is an example of uh, so-called intensity video. Another example which uh, provides, which indicates that not only intensity but also exposure time is very important for non thermal effects of microwave, those responses were obtained by exposing of cells to different intensities of a microwave the lowest one here in green and the highest intensity here in blue. But if you increase the exposure time, then even at the lowest intensity, you can see the same effect as the highest intensity at very short exposure time. So that slide demonstrates actually that changing the exposure time only seven times, you can you can obtain the same effect which has been previous with the shortest time uh, obtained with intensity by eight four orders of magnitude higher. So exposure time is really very important. Unfortunately, uh, real uh, signals from mobile communication have not been tested in, in many studies and there are very few studies which use real signal from mobile communication with real modulation. And uh, in our study, we used two different uh, signals. One of them was so-called GSM signal, and 
here you can see how it looks like in terms of modulation. And also we use 3G or MTS signal, and here you can see how it looks like in terms of modulation. We also use different frequency channels because uh, when, uh, when we use GSM uh, communication, actually there are 124 different frequency channels, and uh, they are supplied by base station depending on the number of connected users. This is the exposure system which we have used, very well defined and described in our publication. And to look at the innate damage, we use extremely sensitive technique analyzing molecular markers of DNA double turn break, which provides the possibility to visualize the places of double turn break and quantify them. So we have found that Microwaves, depending on frequency channel, inhibited DNA repair in uh, human lymphocytes. And that inhibition stays stable even 72 hours after exposure. Interestingly, stem cells were most sensitive to this type of exposure. And uh, this slide shows that cells with multiple DNA damage was most sensitive and microwave exposure completely inhibited DNA repair in this cell. Uh, if we compare differentiated cells like human fibroblast and stem cells, then under all conditions of microwave exposure, human stem cells were more responsive and uh, they actually were more responsive to more GSM frequency channels. And more importantly, stem cells did not adapt to chronic exposure, during chronic exposure to microwaves, contrary to differentiated cells. This result uh, may be really of importance because uh, stem, cell origin, uh, stem cells represent the target for carcinogenesis and leukemia and different types of tumors originate from stem cells by well-known genetic and recently suggested epigenetic mechanisms. In conclusion, I would like to say that independent of frequency channel, most normal microwaves or mobile phones inhibit DNA repair in human cells. And this effect indicates severe stress response and disruption of the balance between cellular repair systems and DNA damage. Importantly, human stem cells were more sensitive to microwaves and did not adapt to chronic exposure, providing mechanistic link to the epidemiological data on increased brain cancer risk in heavy users of mobile phones. And the last slide shows some key references from our work. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kaplan, Suleiman Kaplan. He's from. He's a professor at OMU in um, Samsung, Turkey, and he's the pioneer in analysis of embryology and the author of a major paper published in the Journal of, of Brain Research showing prenatal exposure to cell phone radiation in rats results in offspring with smaller brains and with more brain damage and greater structural damage to their skull. And um, uh, Dr. Kaplan has uh, spent his, his entire career um, working on standardizing and um, coming up with a, a protocol to measure the cell damages in brains and is renowned for his work there. Um, he will be pre presenting his slides in one moment. Yes, well, we have posted on the um, Collaborative for Health and the Environment website, we have posted his paper. Please go to our website, EMF Workgroup, and link there on the left-hand side, you'll see all the it will take you right to all of his papers, presentations, and we'll also be posting YouTube video of those speakers that 
uh, folks this morning that couldn't make it here this afternoon. Dr. Kaplan, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, I would like to thank uh, to the uh, Health, uh, Health uh, Trust Organization and also Dr. Dara Davis gives such a good opportunity to us to give uh, sharing all the uh, experience with all with our audience. Uh, as a, I am a professor in the Department of Honor, uh, Histology and Immunology. Uh, I am uh, dealing and uh, my, uh, my main subject is uh, neuroscience and uh, so in this investigate the toxic effect of the options and also environmental toxicology on the uh, uh, nervous system development. And then uh, we have uh, some uh, experiments that were published in, in uh, recent years and then uh, we uh, show that the, uh, the exposure of the uh, uh, radio frequency, which means the telephone uh, frequency, uh, substantially affects the biological, uh, especially the uh, development of the nervous system. And then we have two types of set of experiments. One type is, uh, is about uh, ten natal exposure of uh, uh, electromagnetic field uh, on the uh, central nervous system. Uh, especially on the brain, and the other part of our experiment is about the postnatal life. Uh, <coughs> I will show you uh, all, all uh, quantification uh, after the exposure we use in all experiment uh, theoretical techniques. Uh, that means uh, this, uh, by means of these techniques we can uh, receive the correct uh, information about the tissue. Uh, after the exposure, uh, we know the exact change in the in the tissue level. By means of these techniques, we can uh, learn and by the, the real change in the tissue. It's a very very important thing. Some of the authors uh, use the, uh, this uh, exposure, and then they uh, may not uh, found any difference between exposure and the non-exposure uh, animal and the experiment. Uh, the, I think the main uh, uh, difference, main uh, uh, unsolved problem is uh, using the un, uh, using the bias technique. If you use the bias technique, that means you cannot communicate with the tissue uh, in real language, and then your language should be uh, the same with the tissue uh, language. And then, uh, if you use these techniques, you get uh, correct information about the tissue. And then, uh, I will uh, mention about the effect of uh, electromyopathy on neuron numbers. And then, uh, this is the, uh, this the uh, a brief uh, summary of the what does mean the stereology. Stereology is a branch of science concerned with the empowering the three dimension property of objects or method or the observed two dimensional. And then if you look at this uh, tissue blocks, you can see three uh, particles. That means we can also say three cells. But uh, if you look at the in the 3D, that means you can uh, count correctly. But uh, in general, we use the section uh, uh, sections and then we can um, we can estimate the number of cells. It's uh, uh, in this uh, picture, as you see in at the right side, uh, one uh, particle gives more profile number, and then uh, at the left side is give two, and then the middle one give only one. How can we found uh, find uh, the correct number of uh, cells? Uh, and then in this point, we should use the stereological technique that uh, approach the tissue in 3D. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if you, your technique is there uh, 2D, your result may be incorrect. Okay. Uh, uh, please look at these uh, pictures. Uh, uh, we uh, we have an imaginary example, and then uh, the, this, this this tissue will have the same number of particles. Uh, or three tissues have 
same factor number. If one tissue, uh, uh, the volume of the tissue increase, that means that means that the number of cells uh, in one uh, unit may be decreased. If the tissue lost uh, their uh, 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 volume uh, without uh, losing uh, losing of the uh, particle in, inside, that means that the, the process of the particle can be uh, seen in uh, one minute of the tissue. And then uh, we should be aware of this uh, this uh, uh, tissue change this without uh, losing any cells, uh, tissue volume may be changed and then uh, or uh, biological common based on this uh, pictures may be incorrect. We have to be careful about it. And then uh, as we look at uh, these pictures, the total number of the particle doesn't change any uh, tissue, but the volume of uh, the tissue is increased. We can see, oh, the three particles can be seen here. Uh, if uh, the volume is decreased, oh, we can uh, count the 13 uh, particles or cells in one unit uh, tissue. And this, if you, if you choose uh, this, uh, Fevers and then uh, your comment is based on these fevers. That means your biological comment may might be incorrect since the total number of the cells, total number of the particles doesn't change any uh, in tissue. Okay, <clears throat> after uh, this, uh, I would like to give uh, some information about our recent uh, uh, recent paper that was published in Brain Research. And then, as you see in here, we use the uh, trend map of exposure of the electromagnetic field. And then, after the uh, exposure, of the, we want to know what happens in the uh, offspring of this uh, rat. And then, <coughs> for this experiment, we have two groups. One is control group, have three pregnant rats. Uh, another group have uh, three uh, electromagnetic exposure group have three pregnant plus. Uh, we use uh, uh, we use the, uh, the, the pregnant rod and then uh, the uh, technical information is uh, seen in this uh, uh, this slide. And then I will like to pass quickly. And then after the exposure of the uh, after the experiment, we received five offspring from the control. Offspring from the pregnant rat, and then uh, exposure groups had uh, 900 megahertz for uh, one hour per day between the gestational uh, gestational period. You know, the uh, the gestational period is uh, taking about 21 days for rat. And that means from the first day of gestation to the end of the gestational day. Uh, this rat uh, received the uh, electromagnetic uh, field uh, during the uh, gestational life. Uh, after the uh, after the uh, offspring uh, born, and then we uh, we look up, look at them, and then uh, four weeks uh, later, uh, that means the postnatal at the postnatal of the fourth week, all animals are sacrificed, and then we. Uh, we, uh, we are used. We use the optical fractionator technique. Is, uh, is one of the technology techniques to count the number of cells in delta gyrus. As you see in this picture, <coughs> uh, at the left side we have a uh, picture. So, uh, it was uh, taken from the control group. At the right side we have a uh, exposed uh, exposed uh, groups uh, pictures. As you see here, a control group has very clear and very healthy cells in the granular uh, layer. But if you look at the exposed group, you can see many of the very dark cells. That means these cells will be died. Uh, these cells will not be for make a, a real function in this. Uh, very important to brain region. Oh, uh, uh, in in this uh, site, I should uh, say that our uh, comment is not based on this picture only. We always 
called the total number of uh, the always estimated total number of cells in any region uh, for uh, making a common in this position. As you see here, we have two groups. One group uh, control group have one billion uh, two hundred thirty-five thousand cells, but the exposed group has uh, nine uh, hundred ninety-four thousand cells. Uh, the difference between both of these very, very significant and then uh, it uh, can be easily uh, seen in this picture. As you see here, this is the granular cells in control group. This is the granular cells in terms of the electromyotic field uh, group. Uh, as you see here, granular cell loss might be caused by inhibition of the granular cells neurogenesis in the delta gyrus during the prenatal life as well as in the postnatal life. I am happy uh, to hear that uh, my colleague Igor Dreyer uh, mentioned about the stem cells of the uh, of the brain or of the human 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 body. As these cells may be well uh, uh, high vulnerable to uh, electromyopathy exposure than the other uh, type of cells. Uh, this uh, result may be uh, parallel with the uh, equal play. Uh, we have we have constructed another uh, study. Uh, in this study, we uh, we searched the uh, effect of the postnatal life exposure of the electromyopathy field. Uh, in our previous study, we searched the prenatal exposure effect. In this, we searched the postnatal uh, life effect of the electromyopathy field on the brain. Brain, and then. We have uh, three groups. One is control, other is shin group. Uh, uh, third one is the uh, uh, electromagnetic exposed group. Uh, each group has uh, six uh, subjects, and then each subject has one hour, uh, one in, in day, for 20 days. That means four, four weeks. And then uh, uh, electromagnetic group received uh, 900 megahertz electromagnetic field uh, in exposure to chambers uh, was placed in the exposure to tube but not exposed to electromagnetic field control group was not placed in the exposure to nor they were exposed to electromagnetic field during the study period uh, this is the uh, information about the uh, uh, exposure uh, uh, degree and then uh, at the end of uh, experiment, that means at the uh, 16 week uh, of the uh, postnatal life, all uh, rats sacrificed, and then we count the, the, uh, the, the pyramidal cell number in the hypocamp. As you see here, after the exposure, we count the some uh, dark cells in the in the in the hypocamp. Uh, this uh, region is long to the uh, memory and the thinking uh, in the brain. As you see in here, the electromagnetic uh, exposure increases the dark cells in that region. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, this, uh, this quantification is by quantification. Uh, it was made uh, using the uh, profile uh, number. As you see in here, we have uh, Pictures which was taken from the uh, from the control group, uh, okay, or from the control group. Uh, another uh, picture is from the chain sh group, and then this is uh, taken from the uh, exposed group. group. As you see here, control chain and the exposed group. As you see here, exposed group have have very well, few cell density, but uh, all common is not based on the, the pictures. They call the number of cells in each uh, subject, and then as you see here, uh, the, uh, the electromagnetic exposure group uh, have very few cells uh, in the terminal uh, layer. Okay, this is also show the uh, dark cell in the exposure group, and then <coughs> we have 
Uh, we have another study uh, I will complete my presentation in four or three slides. Uh, and then we also searched the effect of the postnatal exposure of the erythromycin on the pterodactyl. They count the, uh, the protein cell number in decision, as you see here. Uh, uh, very few protein cells can be uh, counted in the electromyelin field uh, exposure uh, groups, but uh, there is no difference between the control and the shame group. Okay, uh, uh, a long duration exposure of the 9 megahertz electromyelin field on the cerebellum leads to decrease of the protein number in the female drug. Uh, thank you very much. Tissue. 
We also made a uh, realized histopathological and immunohistochemical analysis in the brain, eye, liver, lung, in the kidney tissue. And we, we would like to see what is going on in a, for the apoptosis cell formation. And lastly, we, we analyzed during a cycle by looking to result in the work of autoacoustic emission and distortion, distortion products. We used test of 126 adult pregnant and offspring New Zealand white rabbits. 18 of them adults, 18 pregnant, 18 newborns, two days old newborns, and 20, 72 offspring, one month old. Uh, 36 of female are also analyzed, 36 males analyzed separately. Animals are chosen among having short pregnancies. Some days pregnant rabbits along with non-pregnant were housed in guardian of the laboratory animal feeding and experimental research center for five days before starting marriage exposure. Pregnant duration is approximately, approximately 30 to 30 days, 33 days for these animals. Exposure started at the 15 day of the pregnancy. This is embryogenesis and organogenesis failure. And it was are exposed to 1800 MHz ASM modulated RF with 217 Hz, 20 decibels, DBM, and 14 volts per meter electric field, ambient electric field. The day exposure of 15 minutes per sample. And for the technical information, the SMIC signals at 1800 MHz are formed by signal generator on antenna and squad back The generator power is controlled by system analyzer. The humans of the output radiation is performed with NIDA EMR 300. So exposure system is, uh, for the exposure system, uh, and one month old infant, he also calculated SAR uh, as 1.8 watts per kilogram by using FPVT map. Animals are exposed to RF in flex glass cages. One rabbit, one cage exposure, and four of or of the same one cage condition. On antenna, animal distance was 20 Exposure period was 15 minutes per day and for seven days, as I told you before. And we used 1800 MHz house RFR with a 217 Hz ASM modulated, 20 dBm, and 0.4 watt uh, uh, power and 14 volt per meter ambient electric field. Procedures for laboratory animals approved by local ethics committee of five years. So analyzed groups are adults, which are 13 months old, some groups with nine animals, RF exposed adults with nine animals, again 13 months old, pregnant, some pregnant with nine animals, they are 13 months old, and RF exposed pregnant. And they are nine also, nine animals, and 15 months old pregnant. And newborns, maximum two days, nine shan and nine narrow exposed newborn period. Infant group, infant means one month old uh, infant. They were total of 27 degree animals, 18 shan female infant, 18 narrow exposed female infant. 18 shan exposed male infants and 18 RF exposed male infants. Male uh, infants. Uh, you can see the groups in, in a graphic manner. Uh, we, we have adult shan, RF exposed adult, pregnant shan, and RF exposed pregnant. For the pregnant shan groups, they will get newborns of maximum two days, we analyze them, and then we leave others uh, to live with their mothers one month uh, or the infant, and we analyze separately of okay, their uh, in the manner of sham exposed, RF exposed, sham exposed, male and female. 
and I'll take four. So we analyze one more all x x in front in in different to this uh, male and female group. For the other case for pregnant, we, we analyze newborn again for maximum two days newborn. And for the one month old infant of the other case for pregnant, we analyze them separately for the uh, male and female groups, each having nine animals. After birth, nine newborns from ISH export pregnant and nine newborns from pregnant can export are decapitated. Remaining 72 female and male infants kept with their mothers until they became one month old. They had breastfeeding, their optimum growth was obtained during one month period, and they are decapitated after that. So, analyze parameters. We started with oxidative damage, analyzing oxidative damage with enzyme activities and with end products in the brain and liver tissue. We also analyzed antioxidant enzyme activity in the brain and liver tissues again, looking to the uh, superactive metallic catalog, uh, glutathione peroxidase and, and six different uh, other uh, parameters. We also went to histopathological and immunosophy you know, cancer analysis for the brain, eye, or lung, skin, and kidney tissues, going to the apoptotic site formation. And we, we analyzed healing of that. Now I'm going to give you the results of the I will try to, this is a huge study with a huge number of findings, so I will try to give you uh, the results in, in different, uh, in four different uh, headlines, with oxidative damage, oxidant enzymes, histopathological and chemical analysis, and hearing effects. So, for the brain oxidative damage, uh, we find RFX for adult and RFX for pregnant, uh, we, uh, we find DNA based modification significantly increased in RFX for adult and RFX for pregnant. For the brain antioxidant enzyme activity, we find uh, uh significantly decrease in RFX for adults and RFX for pregnant with catalog and MPO and DSS activity. So that means three radicals increasing both RFX for adults and RFX for pregnant by suppressing radical to scoring uh, uh, challenging enzymes. This is a dramatic change. Increased radical formation in brain might be an implication of cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, ALS, or Down syndrome. This is which one? We don't know yet. So for the liver oxidative, uh, oxidative damage uh, analysis, we found MDA, uh, DNA, we didn't find DNA change for RF exports and RF unexposed pregnant. But we found MDA is statistically significantly increased. And POX is the same. And uh, they are both increased. That means they are uh, enhancing each other. POX and MDA is a uh, oxidative damage uh, type. So for liver oxidative damage for intra-authorin exposed groups, we found no change DNA in DNA a base modification for the newborns of two days old and no change in May one month old. But we, we found a, a MDA and POPs in newborns, POPs difference between newborns and female and male for uh, oxygen. For extra uterine extra exposure group on the liver oxidative damage study, uh, 
we didn't find a, any important uh, DNA-based modification effect. So we can say intrauterine and extrauterine exposure lead to DNA-based modification only for females, even if statistically it is insignificant. So female infants are more effective. In other words, female infants are more sensitive to both extrauterine RF exposure than male infants. Whether adult or pregnant, RF exposure induces three radicals. That might lead to hepatic oxidative damage. It means damage in liver tissue. This in turn disrupts normal metabolism and physiologic physiology of liver tissue. Conclusion. Increased DNA-based modifications and increased free radical formation in brain tissues of RF-exposed adults and RF-exposed pregnant is found in this study. We also found increased oxidative stress in liver tissue of the adults and pregnant. An increased DNA-based modification means DNA change in liver tissue of intrauterine and like is called female infants. An increased DNA modification in liver tissues of exoterin is called female infants. So as a conclusion, we may say English apostatic cell formation in brain and eye tissues of adults, pregnant and their newborn they found. Decrease also health cell motility and distortion product of the acoustic emission attitude in female and decreased cochlear activity, also hail cell electromotility and distortion product of the acoustic emission attitude in male infants. As a summary, we may say that brain and eye tissues of RF exposed pregnant and adult are most affected. Intrauterine RF exposure leads to degenerative changes in cornea, apoptic changes in neurons and in glial cells, and injuries are observed in brain and eye tissues of intrauterine RF exposed female infants. I will give some description of ongoing studies. So we plan and started some of the studies. Here, here is a summary of the plan and ongoing study. We started multiple sensory EMF exposure. This is RFR, uh, 2100 MHz plus ELF 50 Hz uh, on the permeability of PDD in diabetic and non-diabetic. This study uh, already started uh, before I come to here with uh, this uh, form. And skin hydroxyperlone level in RFR exposed rat of 900 megahertz. This is planned. 1800 MHz gave like RFR on the tendency of metabolism related to genes of intrauterin and extrauterin exposed infant traffic, traffic. And we also plan to analyze the effects of intrauterin and extrauterin exposure to the 1800 MHz RF on blood cancer and of the research in infant habits. And we plan also 2.1 gigahertz uh, RF radiation on moderated uh, RFR exposure for uh, 4 and 24 hour exposure in the brain to people blood cells. This could be an in vitro study. Published articles of the pregnancy study, I'm giving the published articles. There are, I think, six or more than six published articles on the pregnancy study they have performed. Yeah, there are six uh, published articles. No, more than six, nine published articles. And I will search things from four different universities, including the University of Medical Faculty Ankara, Biotech Department, and Ankara University Veterinary Assistant and uh, Hagistipi University Medical Faculty and from Kutkala University Medical Faculty. And from these faculties, we studied with 17 uh, researchers together uh, to realize this uh, pregnancy study. 
that uh, I, I'd like to thank you for my team, for resource team, for realizing the, this uh, pregnancy study. Thank you so much. Um, great. Now we're, we're going to open it up to questions after um, hearing all of these different presentations. I'm going to look at the screen for hands up if anyone has a question. Um, just one moment. I'm looking for any hands up. Okay, well, well, we'll open it up for any questions from the room. I would like to ask Dr. Sahan and Dr. Kaplan, um, how do you select your newborns for your study? Because you have litter, you have a lot of animals, and uh, how do you select them? You two days old, and you want to expose them to the IF radiation one month old, and we analyze them. Uh, we have many uh, newborns. We, we select them uh, equally with female and male groups, and we analyze female and male newborns separately. So we just selected some healthy ones. So they have to be healthy. They have yeah. normal body weight. Oh, by the way. Hey, we have one question from the audience. I'm going to come back to the room. Um, first, Ms. Uh, so. Okay, well, 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 open it up for any questions from the group. I would like to ask Dr. Sahan and Dr. Kaplan, uh, how did you let your new Oh, that's not 
some kind of physiological brain issue they may be exposed by the disease of the DNA brain. And uh, some classes of this inside are endonucleases, uh, endonucleases, peristectases, topoisomerases. All those enzymes are involved in normal physiological processes like for example transcription and replication, like for example the DNA topoisomerase do produce double thread brain, just to release superpoint of DNA and to facilitate transcription and replication. But after this process uh, has been induced physiologically, then after transcription has been uh, completed or replication so those physiological DNA breaks will be still by topoisomerase to attempt actually the non-physical animal. So if you are able to affect the thematic activity, to affect those enzymes like topoisomerase, endonucleases, restrictases, then you also will produce DNA double thread break by this way. And it's also possible because all those enzymes actually they contain different metals. For example, topoisomerases, they contain zinc, so endonucleases and the exonucleases, they usually contain magnesium or calcium. And we know well that the uh, activity of those enzymes depends depend very much on those types of ions inside enzymes. And enzymes have those ions not in a stable state, but actually there is some dynamic process when so time are released from enzyme and get embedded through special gates. And as we know from several physical models, like model by Vladimir Pini from Russia, Lenin from Russia, Blackman and Blanchard from the United States, and some other models, so the electromagnetic field are actually they have potential to affect not the enzyme themselves, but they have potential to affect uh, interaction of those enzymes with ions in active separate, you know? And in this way they can affect dynamics, how those ions ions will come in and come out of those uh thematic uh separate. And of course if if you if you induce let's say changes in that dynamic in that way the ions will not take so long long enough inside the exact this is another mechanism. So, another mechanism through systematic activity of those enzymes is still in the logical uh, DNA brain issue. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. I'm going to ask you to stand up now to find the name here. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Thank you for your hand up, Chris Anderson. You are now um, unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes. Oh, this is a very good presentation. I, I'm just fearful that the, uh, the, the evident picture is going to lead to um, a massive breakdown in human health, and uh, particularly um, as uh, devices are increasing in, in terms of density higher and higher frequencies, and then we're going to see a, a mutated human race as, as a result. Um, how can we prevent this? Deborah, we would like to see that best practices for updating use of cell phone radiation as well as other radiation exposures. The challenge we face, and it is great, is that most scientists me grow up with almost no training whatsoever in this field. It is a great honor to be sitting here with these people who have been working on them for so long and who are all my teachers. Right? That is the number one challenge. In science today, there's very little basic 
training in bioelectromagnetics. And because of that, it is entirely possible for very distinguished scientists to come to their position of influence in the United States with no idea whatsoever about the substantial plan and foundation of the information that we were able to discuss with you today. So the first thing that we're trying to do in environmental health trust is to build coalitions of scientists who understand the issue. And I am pleased to tell you all, as you may be aware, that the American Academy of Pediatrics um, just a few months ago sent a letter to the federal communications system uh, with respect to the report from the Government Accountability Office. That report in July said that standards for mobile phones needed to be revised. In fact, that report could be argued to lay the groundwork for losing but at least it is on it has to be revised. So here is what the American Academy of Pediatrics said in response. And this will be in the slide we will be posted later. Quote, as physicians, we think the following policy steps are urgently needed. Protect um, the inviolability of the home by lowering exposure uh, for internal and external forces. Uh, I have I have this spoken to forgive me. The American Academy of Pediatrics did not say that. It is the uh, Physicians' Initiative of the Competence Initiative. The Physicians' Initiative of the Competence Initiative is now calling for another physician plan, and they are calling for curtailing wireless technology, lowering exposure limits to military levels. Whenever feasible, switching to shielded, wired, or fiber optic technology to help preschools, universities, workplaces, Hospitals generally limit the use of cell phones, especially by children, and cut back and reprogram wireless transmitters such as cordless phones, wireless internet access, and wireless electric meters, so that they only operate on demand rather than operating continuously seven days a week. I think that these are all important recommendations uh, that uh, that they are putting forward. And our challenge is that most scientists, most physicians, have no training in this field. And so we at Environmental Health Trust are focused on working with health professionals. And what we continue to do in Wyoming is we have a, a group of two safety cards that doctors are handing out in their office. And those of you who go to our website, environmentalhealthtrust.org, and click on resources, You'll find this doctor's safety pamphlet, which thanks to Nestor has been translated into Turkish and Finnish, and we have Spanish, uh, and a number of languages, and it shows very clearly in two sides over the town what people need to know in order to take this precaution. But that's why what Che is doing here is so important, because we have to reach people with this message. Look, in an ideal world, cell phones would not exist. But that's like saying almost that cars should not exist. Because when cars were first developed, there were no stoplights, there were no rules, there was no safety equipment. And it took, unfortunately, far too long to get seat belts and airbags and all of those things and speed limits and traffic lights set up. And we now have reduced traffic deaths. I suppose society has made a decision that it will accept the risk of cell phones. They didn't ask anybody at this table about that, I can tell them. But since they've made that decision, we have to try to make them as safe as possible. And I do think we have to tell people it's really okay to turn them off sometimes or not use one at all. Thank you. Um, Chris, any further questions on, on that, or did that fulfill your question? Oh, that's very excellent, and thank you very much. Thank you. I, I don't see any other questions from the um, uh, attendees, but, oh, oh, there we go. I see you on, there we go. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. All right, any other internal questions from the group in the room? 
if someone gave you a million dollars, if someone gave you a million dollars, uh, what would be the top three research projects you would start that you can't do now? Each one of you could be a short answer. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, very difficult to uh, spend this uh, very English money. Uh, I hope uh, we need it, uh, much more, much more money to uh, so already we have. And then uh, all the protection of all uh, generations, especially women children, we should do uh, more research on that subject. And then for this reason, we stand and we contracted the increasing uh, system for the exposure, especially uh, cell phone exposure, and then we uh, we make a society to uh, to make an impression on our government, especially uh, most of the houses in the country do not worry about the danger of this uh, this uh, object. Uh, this, uh, uh, harmful effect of the electromagnetic uh, field. And then, uh, the first of all, we have to make a, a, campaign, a campaign about the uh, panel to use of the uh, mobile phone in, in some uh, such areas, schools and the hospital, and the kindergarten, uh, and then uh, should be a uh, safe area for them.
possible correlation between exposure to microwave and the origin of the production of the projective growth of the basic stem cells. So and actually we have started this type of studies which are in the very beginning now. Um, we don't have any data, but that is a research area which I would support if I would have
get protected. I know there are products that can block the radiation. Most of them can make the phone not work. Because if you block the radiation, the phone doesn't get a signal. They can block it. Um, but there, we really do not have information, and it shouldn't be our job to know the end. Thank you. Bye.